Hi. Hello. Hi, Karen. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Derek. Hi, Janice. I don't know Janice, but he's my neighbor. Oh. <laughs> Good to, how are you doing, Karen? Much better. Good. Yeah. Hey, Peter. Sounds like you're connected. Hello there. Oh. In my car, get situated so I can listen while I drive home. Ah, all right. I got to go out and do some social distancing with my buddy who had a stroke. Oh, yeah, he's home after a couple of weeks and recovering well, so that's okay. That's the good side of things. But, uh, had a nice turkey sandwich and some chips and chocolate chip cookies, so I'm living the dream. <laughs> All right, and, uh, thank you, Derek. If Derek's on the line, sent me the link I couldn't seem to access from my phone. Oh, very well. I have lazy, lazy non-access. Yeah, I was saying you lost me when you were talking about turkey, but then you brought up chocolate and then it all. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, Sorry, I heard I'm... Paul, I heard Paul give a, a little bit of this talk at the youth summit the other day and it's like, all oh. right. Fun. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was nice to help support the little whippersnappers. <laughs> Great. I like your background, Bob. Yeah, it's uh, somewhere in in Britain, just one of the many places in the world I've never been. <laughs> and this right. basically everywhere. But anyway. Um, I, it doesn't seem like a good idea right now anyway. Huh? Yeah. I'd still like to know how to do that. One hi. of these days. Uh, hi, Bob. Hi, Other Bob. Bob. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks. Paul will be here momentarily. He's Great. working 24-7, so. Yeah. I put, I put a reminder on his Facebook page. <laughs> That would be me. Ah, hi, Benny. Hello. Hi, Benny. How are things going? Good. Good. I'm in my, I'm in my backyard. Nice. The birds love it here. There's a lot of trees. Wow. Hello, Kenan. Hello. Welcome. And Marcus, I see you've joined us. Um, you can unmute yourself, I believe, if you want to pop in and say hello. Uh, we're just getting started, waiting for uh, folks, including our, our main presenter for today, to uh, get online. Oh, and Marcus is saying his mic doesn't seem to want to work today. All right. Well, um, welcome anyway. If you want to try and uh, try and figure that out so you can join in the discussion later, that might be a good plan. Um, but as we wait for folks to arrive and get settled in, and there's, there's, there's Paul now. Hello. Hey, hey Paul. <clears throat> How is everyone? Good. Nice. Good so far. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, ah, and we're getting a few more, a few more people. We had a, a pretty good uh, roster of people who registered in the last couple days. So um, this will be 
a reasonably full house for, for one of these Nova Sutras discussions. Uh, I was on a call yesterday with a thousand people. It, it maxed out their Zoom account and uh, started disabling some of the features because they had a thousand people on the call, um, which ended in some confusion and frustration, but we got through it. Uh, but that was with Joanna Macy, so, you know, star power. Um, we had a, uh, a really, really deep conversation about um, dealing with the emotional repercussions of where we are right now and um, specifically, you know, going into Joanna's work about um, honoring our, our pain for the world. Uh, so that was, that was very moving. So I'm still vibrating with a lot of that going on. So welcome, uh, Megan and Brenda. Ooh, I like the quote. Um, I love that quote. So you are welcome to unmute and come in and say hello at any time you want as we kind of um, get settled here. Um, just wanting to know how people are doing. Uh, we're... Our overall plan for today is going to be um, a little sort of warm up and conversation. Then uh, Paul will give us a presentation, and then there'll be plenty of time for discussion after that. Um, is that does that still sound like the plan, as far as you know, Paul? I think that's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so I think we're on track. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, just a quick go around for anybody who can join us, just to um, remind us of where you're calling from and um, just let us know sort of what's at the top of your heart right now. What are you, what are you feeling or what's, uh, what's working on you? right now and and we'll we'll keep these pretty brief so try to just give us a little 30 second or so description uh just so we can get a, a sense of where everybody's at and that's um you know if you've got multiple multiple people on your call um we'll trade off between you but i'm going to ask uh to keep the keep the flow going um that each person gives their check-in and then essentially you know, passes the talking stick names the next person to go um, so that we essentially go around in a circle. Um, so I'll start. I already kind of started. My name's Michelle. I'm in Scotts Valley near Santa Cruz, California. Um, and yeah, I've been looking a lot into um, how Joanna Macy's work, the work that reconnects, applies to our current situation. Uh, there's a really great paper by Charles Eisenstein called The Coronation that talks a little bit about um, looking at this transition and envisioning and um, working through the pain to what comes next that could be even better. Um, so that's, that's really at, at the top for me. So I would like to pass to Kendon. Afternoon. I'm in uh, Bonnie Doon above Santa Cruz. Uh, my heart, because of my sense of our focus today, is with a book by Alan Patton and an opera by Kurt Weill called "Cry the Beloved Country," uh, and the um, aria that has that title, which is heartbreaking, but is in my mind in relation to what we are all witnessing and trying to act upon. Uh, I guess we won't pick Paul next, so uh, Derek. Okay, um, relocated last week to Davis in someplace cheaper, warmer, scouting for when my wife and her daughter come over, hopefully later next this year, but we don't know now, the plans are on hold. Um, 
And yeah, just, I feel like one foot still on the cliff and one foot's dangling out over the abyss and just not quite sure <laughs> when to push off and, and take wing. So that's where I'm at. Um, how about Bob? Yeah, I'm, uh, this will sound weird, but the thing I've been noticing a lot is the mail in the post office lately. Um, and the frustrations with it about uh, trying to get masks and stuff. So I'm a little, and I, I'm reading a lot about how people are responding to this virus. Probably the most, I won't say the most moving, one of the most moving things I read was in the New Yorker about a young medical uh, uh, intern who was uh, working a huge amount of time in New York City. And uh, it's a huge learning experience for him. He sounds very bright in the article but the kinds of risks that people are taking while some people in our country are saying people should get the economy moving and just get out. And so it's just weird. I'm waiting for the mail. I've sent away for three things a month ago, over a month ago, and none of them have come yet. So uh, I'm just feeling in a very kind of superficial way this particular uh, aspect of this whole virus at this time. And uh, anyway, I feel a little like I'm playing Russian roulette every time I go shopping. So other than that, I'm okay. Uh, Cook family. Okay, so um, I'm Alex Cook and uh, we're trying to um, we're feeling a little bit cooped up in terms of the virus, um, but we're trying to keep our, we have three sons and uh, have their schooling keep going and um, help them keep, keep their focus as much as possible. Um, and we, you know, just recently had Earth Day and so, and a lot of us are concerned about what's happening in that uh in, in with the environment and so we recently uh listened to a thing about plastics and how they're everywhere and what we can do to like reduce that's about it yeah. and and grateful for the opportunity to share with this group because we're brand new so thank you oh we're supposed to pick somebody so um we'll pick uh nancy glock Hmm. You're muted, Nancy. She was here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect timing. I just got settled into where I could actually come back on the video. Thank you. Oh, it's great to be back with you guys. I um, dropped, I kind of just suddenly dropped out about a week ago. Um, a lifetime pattern. Not among my more endearing characteristics to drop out and not communicate, but I have been very nourished by the many conversations we've had through Nova Sutras and much inspired and also overwhelmed in some ways. And the very day that that was going on, I got an invitation to do a second round in my TV series. And so I'm feeling a lot of hope and commitment in doing that and all the help that is available to do it and the opportunity to be of a real resource for people for hope with stories of success, citizen successes from around the world. And at the same time, everything is so utterly open-ended and crazy in so many ways. There's so many new opportunities opening up that we don't understand and other things that are quite frightening. So I've also been feeling the fear and the grief around that. And most of all, I think the gratitude that even while we're physically separated, the quality of our connections using the technology, but really using ourselves as it were, by being willing to show up and be vulnerable and committed. Um, so I'm really glad to be here today. Um, let me 
Kendon. Kendon has been and done. <laughs> Kendon already went, so pick somebody oh, else. Oh, sorry. Please. I must admit, I'm sorry. I was off. I missed a minute or so. All right. Paul, I think Paul, we got have, here. Have you been yet? Has no, Paul I, been? Pardon? I have not gone yet. Okay, then please do. Um, well, the last few days have been um, quite challenging because I don't want to take a whole big chunk of our time together. Uh, and I have a, a sense of something uh, that I guess is sort of the, the stubborn, uh, expansive possibility of life sort of present all around us, but not seen. Um, and um, sometimes I think uh, sharing, sharing, that's almost really not even hope. It's more like direct perception. Uh, uh, our ongoing humanity, uh, knowing from polls how little has really changed in a way since that first Earth Day. Um, and sensing that the larger, largest obstacle we face is sort of looking in the mirror of the last four decades. Uh, which distorts terribly um, the reflection that we see because there has been a kind of coming apart of public policy and public purpose and the public. Um, and so, well, I'll get into that, but, but the, the talk um, I think may have some fits and starts in it. Um, I had hoped everything would crystallize in a way that, you know, I kept thinking haikus and comic books. <laughs> you know, you can say it in a sentence. Um, so I think today is going to be a little more about telling stories. Um, and we'll see how that goes. And, um, I'm hoping that we can do a little uh, silent meditation at the start. Uh, maybe I can get my heart to stop beating so fast and uh, get a little centered. So I'd love to hear from Benny. Oh, still muted, Benny. Thank you. Um, well, I've recently, last night, listened to Charles Eisenstein reading The Coronation, and um, today listened to a podcast on, from uh, a man named Bayo, interviewed on the Emerge podcast, and they both have like a lot of really important intertwinings, um, and the message essentially was um, that in, when times when become so urgently uh, weird we are our our duty and our role and our uh, what is asked of us is to not um to not view it as solutions look for solutions to a problem but to play with the weirdness um to get more weird and um part of the playing involved is is like a not seeking um in my opinion, and trying to be with the monsters. And so I'm kind of feeling a lot of hope about that, despite all the craziness and, and uncertainty. Um, and I actually just um, this morning was looking for uh, morels in the backyard, which they come up occasionally. And just in the glimpse on the corner of my eye while we were doing this, there's one right here. And there's more small ones coming up. So sometimes you don't want to be looking for, you know, sometimes it'll come when you least expect it. 
Um, and Peter, what's on your heart? Peter, we can't hear you. There we go. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello there. Thanks. Um, well, Earth, Earth Day. All right, thanks. So I was excited about staying in the Earth Day energy and um, so I'm happy for this. Um, and so what's top of my heart is, is the difference between Earth and the Earth. I've been exploring that and exploring Earth as a, as a verb, earthing. And uh, the timing was good that nobody picked me earlier because I got to my destination. So I get to be the, the scenic outlook. Ooh. Took myself to the beach near uh, La Selva, at La Selva Beach. So I'll be joining from here for a while and uh, happy to be here with you all. Because I'm on my phone, I don't know who hasn't talked or not. So if Derek, maybe you could pick someone who hasn't spoke. That would help. Sure, and Marcus says he's got trouble with his microphone, so let's go to Karen. Let's see, am I on? Yes. Yeah. Um, the thing that just came in my mind is last night we watched a TED talk by this very beautiful young woman from North Korea. Um, I can't pronounce her name. Maybe some of you have seen her talk about her escape from North Korea when she was 13. Um, and her talk last night was really for us to understand how fragile our freedom is. So she was giving us a picture of the darkness in South Korea and the total lack of education or understanding that people have. They don't know anything different than what they've experienced. And she told us that that happened in, in North Korea in three generations. So she wanted us to really take in that our freedom is fragile. And um, if we don't look out for it, who will, you know, who will be there for us? So um, she was so moving that I really felt it as this kind of call, you know, to, um, just be more present and responsible to where we are. Not sure how exactly, but um, it was a very powerful talk for me. So. Maybe I could say a word. Uh, uh, I'm Bob here with Karen, and um, I just wanted to uh, uh, let Paul know that I'm uh, just about finished with the recording of our um, the um, uh, poem of yours that I've set to music, uh, which is um, I think uh, a, a, a song which would be fitting for our time because of it, because the point of the song, if I summarize it in a non-poetic way, is that. Um, when we're in this world together, um, we can feel truly encouraged. When we come together, encouragement is there for, meets us there. And uh, it's, that's, that's a terribly bad way of putting something that Paul put beautifully. But I set it to music and um, in the next couple of days, it'll be recorded and we'll see, um, uh, and he's heard the musical setting. Paul and Bob have both heard the, the musical version. And um, so it'll be um, available soon and uh, hope it gets spread around because it's very encouraging language. Who's left? Um, and Beverly's just joined us. Beverly, did you want to um, take a moment just to let people know uh, where you're calling from and uh, what's going on with you? Uh, just a, a little 30 second introduction. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right then. Um, 
so we're going to move on and yes the 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 promised um uh two minute silent meditation is coming up but i just want to check us all in with um the space that we're in essentially uh so this is one of the variants of our discussions in difficult times, but a little bit more of a, a teaching um, option today. That means, um, as most of you know, Paul will be giving uh, a bit more of an extended presentation and then we'll have some discussion afterward. Um, Nova Sutras host discussions like these as a place for people who share the value of um, protecting and celebrating and honoring the living world um, can come together, talk about these very strange times that we're in and um, start to navigate our way forward to something better. So that's the hope that we hold and I believe that uh, what Paul has described that he, he'll be offering us is a clearer vision of where we were 50 years ago that can help us move forward to a much more uh, earth-honoring culture as we try to reclaim, uh, Caroline Casey puts it, cultural narrative lead, you know, that we're the ones who get to tell the story now. Um, so we need to, we need to come up with a story that's very compelling in order to do that effectively. So I will give us uh, about two minutes to just center, just really drop in, take some time to feel your body, take a few deep breaths, and um, you'll hear an opening bell and a closing bell, and then we'll move forward. So here we go. So welcome back and welcome Leoma. Uh, 
if you'd like just 30 seconds to check in. Um, we can uh, we can let you have that and then I think we'll go into uh, Paul's presentation. So go ahead. Well, if I'm checking in, it's just I made it in and I've got no idea why I made it in. When I in the five previous times I tried, I didn't. So uh, the mysteries of Zoom and I are, I thought I had them down, but I was wrong. So uh -huh. hello, hello everybody. It's good to see you. And Nightingale, it looks like you've just joined us. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and did you want to just give us a, a really short check in? How are you doing today? Yeah, uh, we're doing quite well. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm I do have a small headache <laughs> right mm -hmm. now. Okay. And I apologize that we came late because we we just got in from a call with Liberia. But we are doing well and, and we're very thankful and we're really mm -hmm. looking forward to to this, uh, to what we're discussing today. And uh, I'll let Nathan come in real quick as well. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm also doing well and the big for my side, so <laughs> that's good. Wonderful. Okay, so Paul, are you ready to go? Um, so I'm going to say just briefly a little about how the first Earth Day became an obsession for me. Uh, I have spent the last three years researching uh, the climate crisis, always um, asking in different ways um, what the climate crisis uh, is calling on us to do, what it requires of us. Um, Part of that was participating in a discussion group with, I don't know, well over a hundred uh, climate activists on the Central Coast um, who are part of Citizens Climate Lobby, but for the most part not active. Um, so I don't know what all they do um, in, their, in their lives when they're not in that discussion group, but the impression you get is that um, these are people who live every day with the reality of the climate crisis, uh, people who stay current, so they know whatever the latest horrifying uh, study in the journals is, and that they talk primarily to each other. Um, and so as I was, I mean, I started participating in this just socially just curious and, and, and wanting to communicate with fellow activists. But I started to see that there was, uh, there was a way in which I was seeing things very differently. Um, I've been, I have spent pretty much my entire adult life um, trying to understand how the world got into this uh, state and how America specifically did. Um, and although it's, uh, you know, challenging material, my experience of that um, search and just a lifetime of activism that goes with it uh, has kind of consistently brought me home uh, to hope and new beginnings. Um, I should maybe explain my background is in political thought and uh, the political thinker who is sort of my guru is Hannah Arendt, who says this wonderful thing that, you know, she was originally a philosopher. She didn't want anything to do with politics. She was a, a German Jewess in, in Hitler's Germany and uh, and she barely escaped with her life uh, because she stayed behind to help other Jews escape. But that was the end of, I will just be a philosopher. 
uh, for Hannah Arendt. She no longer felt she had permission uh, to remove herself from the political. Uh, and so she went uh, in search of it uh, the way a really good thinker who sort of knew to something does. She thought through it all like no one ever had really thought about it before. Uh, and she came up with this wonderful, uh, clarifying uh, principle that while philosophy uh, sort of corresponds to the human condition of mortality, uh, that it looks at life kind of in retrospect um, and subjects the whole of life to, to a kind of mortal scrutiny. Uh, make, seeks to make life answerable to mortality. Uh, that politics is, corresponds to the fact that we are born, uh, that human life begins. And she says, uh, because every human being is unique, uh, with every birth, uh, a unique essence comes into the world uh, unlike anyone who has ever been before or ever will be after, a someone where no one was before. And she describes politics almost um, almost as an answer to this sort of profound need that we have to be present to each other, uh, to extend the fact of our physical arrival in the world uh, by acting, speaking and acting on our own initiative. Um, and she says, with word and deed, we insert ourselves into the human world. And this insertion is like a second birth. Um, that bears us into the world, uh, revealing not directly to us, but to the others that we engage in, uh, engage with, uh, giving them a view of who we essentially are uh, and uniquely are. Um, so for Hannah Arendt, politics is a, about how human life is in a way always in the beginning. You know, those words that the uh, Old Testament begins with, in the beginning, that, that for as long as human beings are being born and coming into the world, uh, the capacity to begin again uh, is always present. And her ways of talking about this speak directly to what we're do, going to be doing here today as soon as I'm done. Um, speaks directly to the need for people to come together and speak and act, discuss, deliberate, and decide the terms under which we're going to live, um, that that coming together um, is the only thing that has ever prevented, uh, ever saved the human world from ruin, that things naturally fall apart. Uh, we look at things falling apart and, you know, it, it does kind of seem like we have a unique gift uh, for disassembling the world, but, but she would remind us, no, that, that is sort of its tendency unless we are actively recreating. Uh, so with that uh, in mind, um, I'm gonna go back to this discussion group that I participated in uh, sort of rigorously. I read every post, every comment, 
every everything, and to try to get inside the minds of my fellow climate activists and, and see how we were doing. And what I saw was that there was a kind of uh, misanthropic uh, work um, that I think is entirely natural, um, that in their frustration at the decades of inaction and not being, uh, not seeing a clear path to change them, uh, that my fellow activists were doing something that since the election of Donald Trump, uh, there has just been kind of an orgiastic feast of this activity. And it's the activity where we look at what we do not like that is happening in Washington. Things people are saying they should not say, things people are doing they should not do, and above all, if you're a climate activist, the things that desperately need to be done uh, that no one is close to doing. Uh, and the tendency is to then project that back on to your fellow Americans. And voters in both parties do this. Uh, voters in both parties have uh, a version of reality uh, that, that is really this sort of backwards projecting. And it is uh, terribly unfair when you look uh, I call it excavating public opinion. When you look deep at polling and you throw out the polls uh, where they give people cues and prompts and uh, especially partisan cues, uh, and you just ask people, what would you like to see your government do? About 80% of the time we agree. Uh, one of the most compelling and hopeful examples of that uh, is a poll uh, after the 2018 midterms when the Green New Deal first sort of came into our public discourse showing uh, that there was overwhelming support across the political spectrum when they asked voters about a Green New Deal, ranging from 93% of liberal Democrats to 57% of conservative Republicans. Now think what most people, you know, most progressives uh, are imagining when they hear the words conservative Republican. Whatever it is, it is not a population, 57% of whom are really enthusiastic about a Green New Deal. So there is, um, on top of the genuine difficulties we face, a whole layer of fatalism and, and um, despair that, that is based on an unreal thing, on attributing uh, to our fellow Americans uh, views they simply do not hold. So one of the things I did is kind of work backwards from the present, looking at polling, to see if there has really been a, a significant change since 20 million plus Americans, one out of 10 Americans, gathered in the streets on that first Earth Day uh, to defend public health and life on our planet uh, from what was already a very visible and overwhelming, alarming, toxic burden. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, there was a bipartisan consensus then that we needed to take strong action to make sure that money and technology worked uh, to support and enhance life, not destroy it. Very, very strong public support for, if you ask the voters should Curbs on pollution be stronger or weaker? Should they be loosened or tightened? 
doesn't matter what party you're in, voters overwhelmingly say they want stronger protection. They want the laws tightened, not loosened. So that is, I think, um, part of, of the importance of that first Earth Day is that we can look back and see an accurate reflection of how it is that we all actually feel. Um, and that one in 10 in the street, it is, if you know our history, it is simply, I mean, it is almost incomprehensible that that would happen. That it would happen after the Vietnam War, after political assassinations, many things that could have discouraged people uh, from taking that kind of engagement uh, is extraordinary. And having said that, I want to uh, suggest that we close our eyes briefly again, as we did when we were meditating, um, and think for a little bit about the fact that human beings live and move together in time as well as space. And picture yourself right where you were when we were all meditating together, present in the here and now, deep in your awareness. That's a wonderful place to be. Uh, and we can experience uh, directly so much and we can engage with each other so much more effectively when we come from that place. But we are beings who live in history. And it is very easy when you live in history to get lost. Um, and so, now what I would like you to picture is American history from uh, the very first British settlement in the 16th century all the way to the present as kind of a very wide, very long highway. And we're on April 24th, 2020, and we're gonna let our mind's eye go up, lift off from our place in the present. And as we do that, we are able to see larger and larger pieces of our history. Uh, so you can ascend enough uh, that you're back before Donald Trump. That will be a lovely tonic for all of us, I think. Uh, there, there was, in fact, life before Trump. Um, but I want us to go a good deal farther back. Um, in fact, I'm going to suggest a particular touchstone that will help us understand how profoundly American that outpouring of concern for the Earth really is that we saw on that first Earth Day. So we're going to go back before the New Deal. We're going to go back before the Civil War. We're going to go all the way back to before the American Revolution. And we're going uh, to have a chat with Ben Franklin about the Iroquois the way that a lot of us remember our past or imagine our past is that there was nothing but antagonism between British colonists and American Indians. This, of course, is not true. Ben Franklin was a huge admirer of the Five Nations tribes, uh, Five Nations tribes that, uh, that he called the Iroquois. Um, 
especially uh, an admirer of something that I think really unnerved him, which was their ability. Uh, almost effortlessly, he said, uh, to obtain everything that they needed from the natural environment, working together uh, so seamlessly and efficiently uh, and with so little strain or objection to the activity uh, that uh, there was, it took very little time. And so Franklin says, they have a great deal of time left over for what he calls improvement through conversation. And he knew about that because one of Ben Franklin's roles was spending time in the treaty talks and he was the one writing everything down. Um, so he talks about how uh, at uh, tribal councils, nothing is ever decided until everyone has had a chance to speak, that no one ever interrupts, that in fact there is sustained silence when someone finishes speaking, because what if they forgot something? Uh, and, and that as he sees this, he thinks about parliament where everyone screams at once. And the idea that that represents civil, civilization uh, seems like a reach. Uh, he describes their hospitality, uh, the way that any British colonist could walk into the, uh, the areas uh, that the Iroquois they were friendly with occupied and, and be treated like, you know, the most desired guest um, and given food and, and made warm and offered a tobacco pipe. So what he's seeing in, in the Iroquois is a level of civility uh, that seems inseparable to him. Their freedom, their ability, uh, to have this very direct consensus-based democracy. Uh, their, their lack of, uh, their, their lack of um, grievance, their, their, their volition, uh, the way that their energies pour into the world unobstructed. Um, compared to uh, the, the colonists. Uh, he says that, you know, the, the Indians find the ways the colonists live slavish and unworthy of human beings. Um, so, Franklin was not alone in that assessment. There were a lot of people who shared his positive estimate of the Iroquois and did a lot of soul searching about it. Uh, many of the names that we admire, that it is very true of Tom Paine. And there's a, a great many interesting American writers that no one has ever heard of, uh, who did real searching of themselves about this. So, I think of this as a near miss in our past because we, you know, it, it was not predetermined. Many things could have come of British colonists arriving in the new world. Um, and so I think now the climate crisis, one of the things I'm clearest about is that the climate crisis requires us to revisit that particular missed opportunity uh, because it is more relevant today than ever uh, with 80 percent of our surviving biodiversity on indigenous land 
looking for a quote. Here it is. This is one of Franklin's contemporaries um, named Colden, who wrote a lot about the Iroquois. And he says, the five nations have such absolute notions of liberty that they allow of no kind of superiority over one another and banish all servitude from their territories. So this sadly could not be said of the colonists. Uh, and at the risk of overshooting my time and taking us too far astray, I will just briefly mention this fact that no one seems to know, um, although you can find it on Wikipedia, uh, that Jamestown was established in 1607. From 1607 on, between half and two thirds of all whites arriving in America arrived in a condition of bondage as indentured servants. And uh, at one point in Virginia, um, over that, I think it's 1630 to 1650, 75% of the 50,000 whites who came into Virginia were indentured servants. So they were worked so hard under conditions so brutal uh, needless to say, with no pay, uh, they 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 fell ill, um, and and then they were made to work when they were ill. So they just a Dutch visitor said they died like cats and dogs, uh, and that um, experience. If you're Ben Franklin or you're Thomas Jefferson, if you're any of these sort of enlightenment figures who are imagining uh, America as a home for freedom, and you're looking at the Iroquois, and then you're reflecting on what you and your people have brought to the new world, imagine how challenging uh that that perspective would be so i think what i'm trying to say is that when we know that we are really off that we are not close to the mark um, we will know things and not say them because to say them, we, we don't have much hope that we can get to the mark and to say how far away from it we are uh, might make us unpopular uh, and depressed. So I, I, I go to Franklin because I'm saying, I think that one can find a lot of evidence all through the 19th century if you read the letters of ordinary Americans that this sentiment of a possibility lost, an opportunity not seized, uh, to do something other than reproduce uh, the world they had come from. You know, Americans, uh, certainly the men of the revolution, the very idea that this might turn into a country where everything was decided by who had the money uh, it was just horrifying to them, like an obsessive fear of the founders. So I think I want to say that in my estimation, and I have spent quite a bit of time with Americans at different periods in our history, this recognition uh, is, is timeless. And you know where you really see it? is that from the very beginning, uh, Americans would disappear from the colonies, only to be found in Indian tribes, which for the most part adopted them, 
uh, in New England especially. Um, so, you know, th they would try to, to get them back. They would not leave. Um, the lack of individual poverty, the lack of, uh, of the greater than human ruling over the less than human as a social dynamic, uh, the certainty of belonging and the possibility of belonging, not just socially, but of belonging in place, of belonging to the earth, of being part of the earth. Uh, the recognition, I think, of ease, of not being uh, in a state of sort of constant worry uh, and constantly at odds with uh, our own deepest uh, intuitions and impulses. Uh, so I think Crevacur says as late as 1782, uh, thousands of Europeans are Indians. We have not one example of even, we have no examples, not even of even one of these Aborigines having from choice become European. One of Franklin's letters mentions, they did it as an experiment. They let a group of Iroquois uh, receive education from, from the colonists. And what, what, what the Iroquois said when, the colon, when their, their tribe members were returned to them, is that they had become completely useless. You know, they no longer knew how to be in the woods. They could not be taken on hunts. They scared everything away. Uh, they were never comfortable physically. They had lost uh, so much of the confidence uh, sense of how to be in the world that we have to remember these people acquired over millennia uh, in, in, in the Americas before colonization. So now, that in mind, I kind of want us uh, To move back into the 20th century, but not quite yet to Earth Day. And I want to talk a little bit about the momentum of freedom and how it relates to Earth Day. There is a really long stretch of American history where it is not clear that that local participatory New England town hall democracy that is sort of the thing we got right, our good thing, uh, that it is going to end up being relevant. There's a really long stretch of history where that it is not clear that's the case. And as industrialization begins, it, it looks progressively less likely because you have more and more people becoming wage earners. And it turns out wage earners never escape indentured servitude. They are always seen as people who lack the character uh, to direct their own energy. Um, and so it is not just African Americans whose humanity is not acknowledged, who are treated primarily as things rather uh, than people. Um, the differences of degree are huge, don't get me wrong. I am not at all denying that. I am only saying that if you ask in 1933, when my dad turned 16 and one in four American workers were jobless. If you asked then about America, okay, so in this place, whose humanity counts? 
whose humanity is accommodated, uh, who has rights? The answer would be uh, corporate and financial elites and literally no one else. And after reconstruction all the way to 1937, the American people tried to pass laws making industrial America more humane, more just, more reconcilable with some idea of democracy. And the Supreme Court overthrew or struck down nearly every one of those laws, over 200 laws uh, passed, like minimum wage laws or the federal ban on child labor or laws passed to save people from being worked literally to death. Um, so there's this long period where the promise of our first principles, uh, the promise of the Puritans who came here with self-government in mind, the best of us, is not much in evidence. And so for, I grew up the son of parents, youngest child of parents, who came of age in the Great Depression. My dad was 16 in 1933. He witnessed incredible deprivation. I mean, people starved. There was no unemployment insurance. We were the only country on earth with no unemployment insurance because unemployment insurance would have been an accommodation of the humanity of working people. Uh, and as far as elites were concerned, not just corporate and financial elites, but uh, people in government, there was no humanity to accommodate. So think about how we feel today about entrenched corporate power and you know how pessimistic it makes us about the possibilities of change well my parents sort of entered adult life at a moment when it was more hopeless than it is today by far there was no precedent for uh, the good of the public over uh, overruling uh, these entrenched interests and yet suddenly it did and my dad went uh, from being at 16, the only reason his family had food to eat, um, to being an artist painting murals for the WPA and witnessing the sudden arrival in America of public spirit, shared purpose, human activity, millions of people working for the common benefit of all, electricity and indoor plumbing for rural America, an entire 20th century infrastructure. Uh, we built nearly all of our 20th century infrastructure in, in a decade. Uh, the Collective bargaining rights becoming the law of the land at last, so that you could no longer be shot uh, for suggesting that you should share in the profits you generate. An actual consensus that that has to be the case. My parents had the wind at their backs, infused in me a conviction that it's all about whether or not uh, the people are paying attention and asking the right questions. And they never stopped asking uh, the best questions they could come up with. Their questions were, what's next? You know, we've, we've acknowledged that working people are human beings. They are, in fact, sharing in the profits they generate. Now, 1970 is a turning point. Uh, 1970, that is still true. The concentration of income is still declining. Prosperity is still shared. Income gains are still largest among those at the bottom of the income distribution. So this is an American, America, that has been moving for decades in a sustained way along egalitarian lines 
toward an ever more inclusive application of its first principles. This is America that has managed to redeem its beginnings uh, to a great extent. This is an America where that deadly schism between what we all know should be and what we think can be. The we have to, but we can't schism, where we just sort of internalize the grief and rage and injustice and, and disaffection from life that, that seeing people, uh, seeing the humanity of people not honored or, or the independence, interdependence of all life not acknowledged over and over and over. Uh, you know, the, the sense that uh, we have to somehow adapt uh, to a world gone mad was not uh, where people were in 1970. And so that outpouring, uh, that those 20 million people in the streets um, are in so many ways, when I, I, I did a graphic about this, and just a picture of, there's so many wonderful pictures of the streets overflowing on that first Earth Day. Uh, but uh, the graphic said 20 million reasons for hope and and the thing is it's really like that i mean if we i don't know where i think you've been uh been in your vertical ascent while i've been talking but if we sort of try to come down right now together in our mind's eye and be with uh, the people of america on that first earth day on the one hand, it is about pollution. There's no question. It is a response to smog choked cities and rivers that spontaneously combust. Other uh, evidence of pollution, DDT, God knows. But there is also a yearning and a direction. A, think of it this way this is by far the largest demonstration of public will in American history. There is nothing close to it. Uh, no other moment where so many of us expressed so emphatically and unmistakably at once uh, a purpose, uh, a, a direction of change on which we all agreed. And so I'm going to close now, but where this ends for me is with a kind of dialogue I think we all need to have with ourselves uh, and, and with our friends um, that when we think that the people of, our, of America are the problem, uh, that we remember those 20 million bodies in the street and how extraordinary and, and, and unique in our history it is. Um, and that we think about where we might be with the climate crisis if they had just been able to continue. Uh, and I have no idea how long I've talked now, and I think it's way too long. I'm just going to say very concisely, because I think you all already know it, um, there are sort of two main events that follow immediately upon that first Earth Day. One is a decade of astonishing progress in environmental protection. We are the clear world leader. Uh, I mean, there's really no question. Uh, 
So think about that and think about today. Uh, because when our people, when the, the desires of our people uh, were, were still sort of running the show, what happened is uh, 14 really major environmental laws passed. Um, enor enormous progress in cleaning up the environment just in that first decade. Um, and think of, of a Republican president creating the EPA, a Republican president signing more than half of those bills. Um, followed by a Democrat who said we needed to get 20% uh, of our electricity from solar uh, by the year 2000. You add all renewables together. Uh, we're not at 20% yet um, now, but it is not because there was not enormous energy in our people enormous purpose in our people to choose that course what we did not do is validate the theory of the climate crisis that says we have a climate crisis because people are uh, hooked on consumerism and you know they just they live for for consuming material objects and and so they don't care uh, about the earth uh, this is just calamitous, this, uh, this view, but it is so clearly false. And what the reason I mentioned the Depression, the reason I mentioned the New Deal, the reason, reason I mentioned the sort of booming period that followed is that if that's what Americans were like, if we were materialistic, selfish people who just wanted to kind of narcoticize ourselves, uh, with trips to the mall, then that boom after World War II, we would have gotten really addicted and we just would have moved very rapidly uh, in, in the direction that that suggests. And we did exactly the opposite. It took two generations of Americans who were not fighting to survive, who had a measure of financial security, and who had access to college, just two generations, uh, to produce the most political uh, generation since the founders, engaged with a whole set of questions about who we are and what our reason for being is and how we should conduct ourselves, questioning everything, uh, and specifically saying, uh, you know, the pursuit of money is doing real violence to life. How about life as our top value? Uh, so, I am a much harder critic of myself than you might guess. I, I question everything I, I think. But I have managed to sustain for uh, four decades now uh, an informed belief. I see nothing to contradict it and a great deal to confirm it. That if you ask yourself, well, what is the human response to this? What is the most human way that we could feel about the conditions of life today? you will inevitably arrive at feelings that are ubiquitous among us. It's, it's really a matter of not knowing what to do with them. So the, there's a, a decade of wonderful progress and you know, certainly with Carter, the suggestion that we might actually do what we needed to do part of it at least, to address the climate crisis. But the fossil fuel industry, unfortunately, uh, had its own response to Earth Day. And I'm not gonna talk about that because it's depressing and I think we all know it uh, at any length, but I will just say, um,
for all the horrors in our past, all the things that have been terrible. In 1970, we still had consensual reality. Um, and the one thing that we did not have to struggle with is whether we were all dealing with the same set of facts. Um, and then the fossil fuel industry had a good look at Earth Day, at that Clean Air Act, which they rightly perceived as a tremendous threat uh, to their future. And, and you get the Powell memo the very next year, and you get throughout the 70s, while we're making all this progress, this proliferation of think tanks that are paid not to think, um, that on the questions of the environment produce endless papers saying that environmental protection somehow hurts us more than it helps, uh, that uh, on progressive taxation in the New Deal, you know, somehow these things that, that have done so much to improve conditions of life in America are really ruining life in America. Uh, somehow tax cuts for the wealthy uh, are, are a miracle drug that solved virtually every problem unknown to man. Layer upon layer upon layer of position papers with PhDs attached to them. And so there's this moment in 1980 when, when Reagan's elected and, and you see an entire government that is the product of a fossil fuel industry unwilling to even consider a world that doesn't revolve around it, finding other interests and engaging in this audacious project to create something that doesn't have any of reality's offensive features, uh, a reality alternative. Uh, Kellyanne Conway is right. There are alternative facts, but public policy from 1980 forward under presidents of both parties is mostly conducted on the basis of corporate think tank product, sort of in a wholesale substitution of a fabricated uh, pseudo reality, uh, right down to phony grassroots organizations expressing great enthusiasm for a regime of poison, pillage, and plunder. Uh, so the distance that we feel between Washington and anything that makes sense to us, uh, the, the kind of just constant mental uh, difficulty of, of having to watch public policy serve exclusively private aims and, and do it, uh, you know, in the process of making over and over again the same uh, incredibly false claims. That, um, that is about sociopathy at work in elites. What it is not about is the American people. Um, and I think the place to now close is with something that the Greeks understood about reality, uh, that reality is not um, external to us, that Reality comes from us gathering together and sharing our impressions and responses to what is. Um, you know, Heraclitus says that you are not awake unless you're experiencing the reality that is there, whether you're thinking about it or not, that is real for more than you. What is real for us collectively? And so I think these conversations that we've been having uh, 
through Nova Sutras are medicine for what ails us and far more powerful than we know. I just think we need to make a kind of big push to make this an activity for all Americans uh, who have, you know, we all have concerns. None of us are happy with the, the state of things. None of us can really avoid the burden of the, the possibility of humanity not continuing. Um, but, but the need to sort of come up with a format, something marketable, a way of uh, reproducing what we've been doing, because I don't think you need a lot of it. You know, we don't need one in 10. If we could get one in 30 Americans uh, participating in this kind of conversation on a sustained basis, uh, that I, I think, uh, will turn the tables on our situation because what seems so formidable, look, they have all the money, they define reality, the whole thing is a closed circle, we can't even get in there, also makes it incredibly weak, right? They've been clinging to this false thing while the world moves in a very different direction where actions still have consequences. And bad policy still does terrible things. So, I mean, we're living with, with realities that are harder to bear than any human beings have ever faced. If we can stop doing that alone, I think we will be fine. Uh, I think if we can just recover our ability to generate a sense of reality, a sense of where we are in history and what we need to do about it together um, and not look anywhere else uh, for it, uh, but to each other. Um, I think that's, that's where I'm going to end up. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to make sure that we have the visual reminder. I just, this was such a, such a clear um, statement and so powerful. Um, so I really, I wanted to make sure that I shared that. Now I'm recognizing that we are, uh, actually only six minutes away from our official closing time. Um, I'm happy to keep us going a little bit longer, but I wanna, uh, wanna honor and acknowledge that not everyone can stick around for the discussion. So we'll, we'll go into discussion agreements and have a discussion go as long as people want to hang out. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna give a little bit of closing for people who might need to leave. Um, we are planning to have an ongoing discussion series as much and as long as we can. Um, and we really do want to bring more people into having conversations like this. I think, Paul, you just articulated it so well why these are essential just to, um, to provide that space. And the fact that we now have so many people who are um, whether they want to be or not, liberated from their previous uh, busyness that was providing paychecks, um, that, uh, that things might be shifting there. Um, of course, we'll need some support to, to keep that up, so I encourage you to check that out on the website if you can. And one of these requests is uh, to become what we're calling Nova Sutras Uplifters, which are the people who, uh, in this moment are going to be largely helping to uh, make this more replicable, to make it possible that we can have lots of these discussions open to as many people as possible. Uh, you can find out more about us on our website if you haven't already checked that out. Um, 
And I want to give a brief mention to the next discussion that we have lined up, which is this uh, day after tomorrow on Sunday at three o'clock. Um, and that will be talking a little bit more about uh, how each of us can participate and what we can bring to uh, making this vision of having open discussions uh, more practical. Uh, that will be followed by a series of trainings where we're actually going to help walk people through some of the skills and techniques that, um, that we've been developing that might help make this, uh, make this sustainable and, and um, grow in a major way. Uh, the other thing that Nova Sutras offers is guided meditations. One of the other things we offer is guided meditations, and there will be one of those next week as well on Thursday. Uh, so with that, I'm going to actually take us into the conversation question and um, just remind us of these agreements that while they don't quite get us to the extent of the uh, Five Nations Council process, which is very expansive and would be lovely to just set aside a whole day to do at some point, but, um, but to give us a chance to have a little bit more expansive conversations for say the next half hour or so. Uh, and a lot of it is about deep and respectful listening, that non-interruption, full attention, really honest, authentic, open sharing, and um, honoring diverse points of view and assuming the best intentions from everyone participating. Uh, this is being video recorded and we will be posting it on YouTube. So if there's something that you want kept confidential but you want to say to this group, try and let me know and I can pause the recording uh, and that will help. Okay. So I'm going to stop share. And now I'm going to unmute everyone. And um, especially if you're needing to leave very soon, if you want to say some, something in response or something in closing, I encourage you to go first. So I'm just going to unmute everybody. Uh, but you may still have to unmute yourself if you had muted. So. Um, I would like to to go because uh, I do need to leave in a few minutes and I just want to say thank you so much Paul for uh, for your sharing it was both I learned a lot and I, um, it, it's very thought-provoking and so more than anything else I look forward to more of these conversations where um, where we can see, we can discuss and where I can also see all that I'm able to do to fulfill this cause that we're all so hopeful about, that we can you know, bring in some changes about this climate crisis, or at least uh, you know, find ways in which we can uh, accommodate some of the changes that have happened that we cannot um, reverse. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nightingale. And Derek, I know uh, you said you needed to leave soon. When we're dealing with a system, um, it's there's just so much to unpack. Um, I definitely appreciate the different perspective. I do like the way you went back and brought in the very founding of the country because that those founding values um, have carried right on through to a large degree. Um, personally, I think the systemic issue about the money and the way money is used. Um, Michael Rupert once said, until you change the money, you change nothing. And I see money in so much of the politics and so much of the economy and so much of the natural destruction. Um, and then the other piece I'll say in particular about Earth Day 
it was an amazing time. It was an amazing decade that followed. And then it was almost like we went, okay, done that, and government will take care of it. And we got back down to our own personal lives and let go of it. And because we didn't hold them accountable uh, for what we wanted them to do, we lost grip on, on power, and it's just been downhill ever since. And so I just hope that whatever we manage to do here, we manage not to make that same mistake and, and just let go of the reins and think somebody else is going to take care of it for us now that we voted the right way. And um, yeah, that we find a way to hold them more accountable. Go ahead, Kenny. Yeah, and then oh. you. Oh, thank you. Um, of course, many thoughts. Um, in passing, as you were going back in time, I was going back in uh, development to a union of a sperm and an egg and what preceded that, looking into that past and going back into levels of my mind and my brain that take us to being and beginning, but relevant to what was just said about money and what Paul enjoined us to do, loosely speaking, if we have slave owners in our ancestry, that part of our task is to uh, be present to them and to somehow take in what gave them who they were uniquely. Um, so in parallel to that, 1970, 1980, uh, the Lewis Powell Memorandum, for those of you who know it, the, I will call it horror of conservative America at where the world seemed to be going at that point in time. And that having that as part of what we are present to and thinking about the future, there's seven generations generation since, there's seven, seven generations preceding, um, and I have not done my homework, so I will make a note to myself about that, that I don't really have a sense of where the Lewis Powells of the world, they thought communism was going to take over, and they had to stop it somehow, or at least some of them did, and some of them were motivated, of course, individual greed. So that's part of the historical task that flows from the discussion we're having. And with all of you, I want to say the, the idea of the Iroquois Council, the idea of respectful listening and uh, the Nova Sutra values uh, that are informing our coming together, I heartily welcome and we're learning to make them a part of how we communicate with one another. And so I didn't, I didn't see a hand up. Nancy. Nancy. But I don't have to leave right away. I do have to leave fairly soon, but not right away. So if there's anyone else that needs to leave sooner, I'm not sure. Paul, I was just profoundly moved. I just sent you a message, but it was so well constructed, so well articulated, framed such a kind of precise thread that you were leading us through that I was very moved by at what I feel is a profound truth or a profound way of storytelling that the power of story is the power to liberate our creative energies woven in with our best tough-minded understanding of the realities that we're interacting with. Um, I think the only, well, two things. The focus of the next series that I'll be doing, um, because it was what people most wanted, was the how-to how to do this and to understand better what happened in the last 50 years that we lost so much control or sense of control or belief 
in it because most would say probably the two beliefs that most harm us no i want to say three one is that we are powerless two is that we are harmful and three that we are not to be trusted between each other and within ourselves we don't trust ourselves and we don't trust each other and i think those stories can be remedied i think they can be replaced and what i hear you doing is helping to frame the alternative story where i am a piece of it that i'm struggling with and it ties into next sunday's conversation is it is not it is necessary profoundly so to come together in the way we're speaking of but it is not sufficient we need also to be well informed we can come together in ways that reinforce our fears our prejudices our misunderstandings our dangerous misunderstandings of those outside our circle and what is needed and the part of what the iroquois had they had as you said knowledge of the world they inhabited of what that world required of them and what they required of each other so when they sat in council they sat in place they sat in connection and partly because we have been deprived of that partly because our educational system while wonderfully liberating in some ways is also profoundly enslaving one of the most influential people in my life story for another time but i want to name her rosemary goodenough the founder of friends outside working with prison families who accidentally missed getting an education because of world war ii in england said that she was glad that it happened because education makes you afraid mm -hmm. and i didn't understand it when she said it but now i so thoroughly do so we've been partly distorted and also the world is is so complex and ra so rapidly changing and as kendon has been so eloquently teaching us we have also been through a misunderstanding of what science is about been deprived of our own deep instinctual knowing and access to it so i'll just put in there as a kind of placeholder right now um i think i'll i'll use tom atley's model for what he calls wise democracy another time i'll share my model of what i call do it ourselves democracy but in the wise democracy he said there are three things we need we need people coming together at this deep level of participation engagement developing mutual trust and care and insight and creativity through diversity through harvesting diversity and we need that process to be empowered to make the decisions that shape the structures and systems within which we live and thirdly we need that process to be informed by wisdom by intelligence by knowledge of the deepest kind about what truly results in the health and well-being of all we affect when we make decisions all affected by our decisions need to be held in that kind of understanding out of that we have a wise democracy so as we in these conversations are sorting out how we do it i'm particularly interested in the dimension that has to do how do we learn together thank you so very much because you were such a stunning example today of a teacher for us paul 
I always learn so much. Thank you. Liama, go ahead. Mm. Well, I'm going to have to go back and pick it up most of it from the recording because my sister called from the nursing home in the middle of it. But picking up from where Nancy left off, I'm very much interested in how we structure the process of conversations. If we can figure out how to provide a platform that would use what Nancy was talking about. So it's a platform which encourages diversity and honors that, a platform in which we can speak about power. I mean, there should be ways to structure this in, you know, the power, the, uh, the knowledge. And also I think of that model as circled by the natural world, impinging yes. on coming in at all points in the process. And I, the internet developed a hub structure. Um, you know, I think we should, conversation for another time, is look at the sort of structures. And another thing that developed with the internet is there are also places that are isolated and not in contact. I mean, whole areas that are not in contact with other areas. And so I, that's a conversation I'm just putting out. That's a conversation. How do we structure the platform? Because part of the ways the power you can gather power is by making new connections. In evolutionary terms, that has often been a way where we where something new evolves that you connect in a different way. And I will end with bringing in my grandmother's spirit into this. He was born in the South, oh, maybe for 10 or 14 years after the Civil War. I mean, just talking about change, a perspective on change. Okay, this is my grandmother within what somebody called the warm connection. I mean, I touched my grandmother. And she was born 14 years or so after 10, 14, shortly after the Civil War in Virginia, not far from a place where there was an infamous slave factory where they bred. I mean, I can't speak of it without, they bred humans for slaves. And she as a child knew people who had been born into slavery. She lived through seeing the coming of the car, the airplane. She saw the first man walk on the moon. She told my cousin, who was going out on a date, no, you're not, you're gonna stay here and watch this, this is historic. She also told my cousin, who was a teenager at the time, that about the slavery, do not let anybody tell you that we were not all complicit in the slavery. She had some of her siblings to their dying day were staunchly prejudiced and did not believe in the equality of, of those who had, who had formerly been slaves. She herself had a grandson who was a doctor in Puerto Rico, who married actually a couple of nurses in succession, Puerto Rican nurses. She had, so she had great grandchildren of multiple shades of brown. And because they were her great grandchildren, she loved them. She made the turn. Not all her and her family did, but she made the turn. Leoma, what was her name? 
Mona. Thank you. Mona Mobile was her married name, but Mona. I keep thinking of uh, your comment about things where was a certain continuum after World War II through just about 1980, but the 70s to me was, um, I keep thinking of everything we're dealing with, with our literal government and many around the world, it's as though the government's like a shadow version of itself. We're dealing with our shadow, maybe it's our dragon, our shadow that we have not found an effective way to really talk about in a way that that informs people, helps them, maybe it challenges them, but they don't get stuck back. I, I, I don't know what miracle we need to do that, but I, I keep thinking of throughout this entire conversation of people have a chance to be together freely and fear and greed which is today our government, we have half the government literally saying, go back to work. Sure, a lot of you will die, but we need, we need the money. If that isn't a shadow, a shadow sense of a government, I don't know what is. It's really madness. We live in a time where things are so brightly illuminated. It, it takes a very specific, intense type of lying to just even maintain this, this facade. And the sad part is that we are still subject to it. it. It's, but I think in the seventies, what I was going to say is the sixties, we were, there was a lot of young people in there. Me, born in 1951, I was right in the core of the whole thing. And uh, I really think the seventies, we were being, we were being challenged about this new world we wanted. And the challenge came with the, from, in a sense, the shadow people, the people were very unhappy with what happened in the 60s, which was the best educated middle-class generation ever in America decided, we want to change some things. So we encountered our, our shadow. We, we, encar we encountered the kind of alienated parts of our, the body politic that felt like, well, it's now or never for us. That's what the Powell memo to me represents as well. I mean, it also doesn't make sense to me. It's like I'm writing a screenplay for a terrible villain in a film, but it doesn't, <laughs> that's what it's like. And now it's really, it's, I'm hoping it's at its culmination. The good news is that maybe with, we do have enough light between each other, our technology, modernity itself does offer us something. But I know in other countries, times like these devolve into scapegoating and coming back to the same message that some people just aren't worth as much as others. And this is a, this is a great deal of what we're getting from our shadow government right now. Mm -hmm. So this is a big, this is a huge test right now. It, it's certainly hard <laughs> to be glib about it, but it's really important. I'm trying to take from this, how we can talk about this, this, going toward freedom and then taking a step back. And it's the people who feel left out. It's the alienated part that we're not confronting that continues to do this. Though I do think there's a, there's an odd intense level right now, which simply means that we've just, we've dropped the reins. We've let it go too far. And this is what we inherit this. I think we all know that to some degree, but there is an active force of this. That's a, uh, I think I didn't really believe I'd live to see something like this. Anyway, what we were talking about was reminding me of a lot of these things. In a... Just an added note, my vague sense is that Powell, my vague understanding is that Powell was trying to save civilization. Now there may have been yeah. you know, deep-rooted personal motives, but that's why I feel the need to understand it better than I do because he represented a zeitgeist that has won in certain ways for over a period of decades. And I need to know that zeitgeist better than I do. But I, their generation came and, and started dying. They lost, they lost culturally. And 
there was this whole thing has been about a death grip from our past that continues to be manifest. I think it's just stuff that we hadn't quite processed. Our political theories and everything else didn't really deal with the, the human problem of how we go forward together. It's, I think in the modern day, we can start talking about things in those terms maybe a lot more. That we have to find some way where people don't feel alienated and left out, yet at the same time, this is very dangerous right now. So, it requires action, obviously. The first action is talk, speaking, thinking together. It requires right action. Well, um, Bob, you actually kind of captured two of the pieces that I had wanted to, to pull back out of uh, some of the earlier threads yeah. of this conversation. And uh, one is how, how do we have power in these conversation circles? Um, and, you know, in particular in the current context, um, what does it mean to be gathering this way? And how do we, how do we use the power that we're generating together in ways that actually are going to have positive influence on the world? Um, so that's one question. And then the other question is, how do we, how do we expand the diversity of these kinds of conversations? How do we invite and include um, people? And I'm thinking of, you know, the vast majority in America is completely unfamiliar with how to have a conversation like this. It's not something that happens in school. It's not something that's part of their normal everyday life. Um, it's something that's actively discouraged in many contexts and places and through many channels. Uh, and making, making something like this into an offering that is welcomed by people who have never been offered a space like this before, um, that, that feels like a true invitation and a place where their interests and needs will be met. And I think that that, that piece of it is a missing piece of what the, where the power from these conversations is going to come from and how it's going to be expressed in the world. So I'd like to follow up with some ideas about next steps. And I really like this idea of thinking intentionally about ways that we can try and scale or try and do a deep dive into thinking about how what we are doing can have an amplified impact. So just to mention sustainable development goals, I think if we explicitly tie things that we do um, to sustainable development goals, it will uh, build on existing international language and agreements. Also project drawdown, which uh, gives quantification for um, essentially carbon benefits or addressing alleviating the climate crisis is another framework then I would say we really do all that we can to highlight stories about indigenous people, indigenous ways um, as alternative, more hopeful, more earth-centric, more equitable ways of relating. And I know there are maps available that shows historical distribution of indigenous people, but I don't think that there is yet enough or yet an intentional undertaking of communities or groups of whatever type. I really think about uh, moving forward from a health clinic standpoint, health systems, uh, that I think bringing in environmental considerations, partnering with indigenous people is a way to get to that perspective in a humble way um, of looking at previous examples that were unfairly um, marginalized or uh, victimized through 
genocide and other such tragedies. But uh, that seems to be an opportunity that we can do a deep dive into our local region, indigenous ways, and then we can try and work with other people to think about mapping um, indigenous groups that are still present. And if they're not present anymore, they're still the memory, they're still the story, the land still speaks. Um, the ancestors still call, I think. So um, that's another idea. Then eco-villages um, have a lot of models uh, for ways to relate and some um, frameworks at scale. So just thinking about looking at some of those um, and things that we could borrow or potentially what would distinguish what we're doing uh, from those. Then there's a scholar by the name of Murray Bookchin mm -hmm. um, who talks about social ecology. And there was um, seemingly something really exciting happening in, I believe, is it Turkey, the Kurds, uh, Northern Iraq, mm -hmm. um, that was uh, dealt a devastating blow, I think, um, maybe in October with what Trump did to I forget the specifics, but basically mm -hmm. withdrew support and made it so that that very exciting um, development that was explicitly trying to translate Murray Bookchin's political theory into a geographical region and a way for a community to relate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think social ecology has a lot of similarities with what we're talking about then the last idea would be as we do a deep dive into thinking about our community and how we can essentially leverage power um, is what, if we're honest, the, the money question and um, the competing political interests who are actively trying to consolidate and um, have it so that it's the anti-Iroquois model where people um, say that they feel or they, they've, um, swallowed the lie that they are superior and others are inferior. So just to know that that is out there and to some extent, although very cautiously, we, we can't make up entirely new rules. We have to play to some extent by the rules of the game that are out there. Um, so anyway, um, a Facebook of sorts that could be like a social and ecological network that would say it's not just enough to connect because I think the point Nancy is making is you can come together and be very ill-informed or very selfish and uh, destructive. But if there could be a Facebook of sorts that would encourage and uh, in some ways like affirmative action uh, using that political terminology, but um, preemptive, proactive, going to places where people are not able to tell their stories or they they have been damaged uh, by the existing structures and systems which tell them that they are inferior and really going to those people making it uh, as easy as possible so that everyone in every place can tell their stories about what matters for them in a way that is unifying and promoting of um, just having life um, continue and flourish as much as possible. So these are stories about sustainability, they're stories about unity, they're stories about humility. Um, that would be my dream to, to try and see about uh, building that type of platform where we can all learn from each other, our honest and true uh, deep voices as unfiltered as possible, but with the the explicit intent that we are sharing those stories not to initiate a race to the bottom, but a race to the top and to bring out the best in each other. Nathan, thank you so much. Um, I, as you were talking, I, I like put, put in uh, links to all the Nova Sutras pages that hit on some of the very same points that you mentioned. Um, sustainable development goals, drawdown, uh, land acknowledgement and engagement of indigenous people. Um, and then I tried to make some notes and I just wanted to, to note that um, in the mid aughts, um, probably 2007 to 2010 or so, um, there was a, 
a website called Wiser Earth that was essentially, you know, before Facebook really took over everything, it was an alternative to that that was specifically for uh, the movement of movements that Paul T Hawkins talked about in Blessed Unrest, you know, the, this coming together of earth-based movements, indigenous movements, social justice movements. Um, and uh, it fizzled. And one of the, one of those research projects that I've had on a back burner for a very long time is trying to follow up with them and find out why it fizzled mm -hmm. and uh, see if, if something like that could be, um, could be reinstated in a more successful way. Um, yeah, because I think that's yeah a lot of a lot of what we're facing is the you know I despise Facebook because <laughs> of a lot of things that it does, but a big part of it is the way that it manipulates people's social interactions. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and that that there should be alternatives to that that people can um, can find themselves in and fit better in, but. But given the nature of social networks, it's very hard to do now that Facebook has everything. Yeah. So. Thank you. Are there other things that people want to say, people want to share? Again, I just um, need to express so much gratitude, Paul, your, your talk and the, the clarity of the ideas and the perspective that it provides us is so powerful. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Can't wait to get this online and out in the world. Okay, well, oh, Karen, were you trying to say something here? I think you need to unmute on that side. That's funny, I just, I hadn't quite decided really. Um, I guess I, I just want to say some things that I was struck by more than anything else. Um, but one is the idea that we aren't really ourselves until we participate with others in, in a reality that we create together. That seems to me so important and powerful and true. Um, and, you know, I feel like that's something that needs to start with kids young and the idea, whole idea of council and of a place where people can come together um, in town halls and forums and circles um, but that, that's somehow really essential to people having a sense of, of themselves as powerful beings. Um, I also think it's really helpful telling us stories about our history. Um, <clears throat> for most of us, it's something <clears throat> we studied once in school when we were little, and it's not very present anymore. <clears throat> and I thought about our brother's poem, History is Behind the Eyes. <clears throat> our uh, <clears throat> brother, Lucian, who had more than anyone I've ever known a sense of the um, ongoing continuity of the past with the present. And um, it, was, it was not a metaphor for him that history is behind the eyes. It's, it's right there. Um, and oh, I thought the title of your talk with 20,000 Reasons for Hope was like, so wonderful, but I feel like those stories, um, you know, about Ben Franklin and the Iroquois and the founding of Earth Day, we need those stories. Um, we need them a lot right now. Um, and other than that, I just have a lot of questions. Like I think, uh, you know, like the North Korean woman said, our history, our freedom is fragile. We are really in danger, um, you know, I, we all need to be talking to each other like this. You know, how do we do that? Not everyone's going to come on, you know, this particular uh, group, but people need this kind of experience. So that's about it. I don't know if you have anything. 
Good, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, Kendon, you're still muted. Yeah, can't hear you. Can't hear you. Yeah, you'll need to unmute from, from your okay. outside. There you go. To the Andersons and to Paul, we look forward to the song and the poem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very much. Well, I feel like we're getting close to uh, closing here, unless there's there's other things that are wanting to be said. Um, oh, go ahead, Liam. Oh. Maybe I'll send out the beginning of the Dream Egg story, which is about Ubuntu, because oh. it's a story that I'm wanting to people to co-create together. Wonderful. Okay. I, you know, I, I saw that email from you, and I haven't had a chance to do anything about it yet. Um, but well, what... You <laughs> yeah, what I would what I would like to do, um, and and we can talk about this more later, is that we might make it a, a shared Google document that um, that people can uh, at least put their comments and suggestions in. So um, you and I should have a have a conversation about that, and we'll we'll make that available. Um, and I think did that email go out to everyone in this group? Have you all seen that yet? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. So I'll try and help out with that as well. Um, and yeah, that, that reminded me, thank you, that, um, you know, one of the key founding concepts for Nova Sutras is this idea of Ubuntu, which is one of the short definitions for it is, I am because we are, um, that we are really not uh, and can never be individuals in isolation. There is no such thing. Um, we are a highly social species and everything about us is about the people that we're connected to. Um, and, you know, and, and then, of course, taking that even for, further, the, all of the other beings that we're connected to and completely dependent on. Um, and that shapes who we are. So thank you for surfacing that. So I'd like us to just. I, oh, I, I wanted ahead, this is Nancy, just a tiny little personal note. One month to the day prior to, um, excuse me, one month to the day following the first Earth Day in 1970, April 22nd. My son, my oldest son and first child on May 22nd, 1970 was born, which is what I was doing for, for Earth Day. And he will have his 50th birthday in a month. So I just wanted to share that personal note with you all. For me, it's his, always his a, name. For those of you who know him, some of you do, is Eric Glock. <sighs> well, dear friends, thank you so much for um, this amazing conversation. Paul, thanks again for bringing so much. Um, knowledge and wisdom and such a craft for storytelling to what you did. It just, um, it works on so many levels and I'm just, I'm always so impressed. Um, so thank you. So before we go, um, I'd like to invite us to maybe just take um, not even a minute of silence to really drop in. feeling the gratitude for what took place here today.
And then to give us that chance to virtually reach out and hold hands. And really feel the, <laughs> the love and wisdom that uh, that is emerging from this community and the amazing things that I think we're going to be able to do together as we keep this going. So thank you so much, everyone. Mm. 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 All right. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Nick. Mm. I'm going to close out now. Bye. Okay. Take care, Liam. <laughs> <laughs>